But yeah, so um, you know, I'm Daniel D. Jones, as they call me. Um, you are Rose Jones. Great last name, by the way. Gotta put that on there for show. I'm saying you. little, I'm saying little <laughs> comedy drop for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? First things first, I um I wanted to, you know, say thank you. I saw that you had put that post up on Facebook. You were asking to uh, you know, do interviews with different podcasts and so forth. And um, I, you know, responded back to the post and um, you know, you were willing to grace us with your, you know, your expertise and your presence. So truly appreciate that. But uh yeah, definitely tell us about yourself, um, what made you want to do the interviews and so forth and all that good jazz. And I'll kinda I'll feed off of that energy and ask you some questions. Um the reason why I want to be on podcasts is to pretty much tell my story. See, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, uh, childhood trauma, and um, I'm currently battling PTSD. And part of my healing journey, I feel like, is helping other women um, acknowledge their story and uh, come up and have strength to tell their story. So me having a platform to open up and tell my stories about what I experienced with domestic violence is pretty much my journey of this podcast. It's like just needing a platform where I feel safe enough to open up to the world about what I've been through and just giving other women like a safe place to do the same thing. It's like, I'm kind of still new at it because, um, I'm still in a process of getting comfortable with my story and acknowledging it. But I think the more I do it, the more comfortable I will become in the process of telling my story and having a safe platform for all women to do the same. Well, for sure. I think that's really uh, admirable um, that you want to share your story um, and just kind of, you know, be, be a, like a voice for people to kind of bounce off, have energy, um, feel inspired, motivated from hearing your story. Do you want to share like, you know, any part of your story now, or do you, do you just want to, you know, not do that? I want to, like, you know, add. No, we can, we can go into, um, the biggest part of my story is pretty much, I've been in three abusive relationships. Um, uh, I got one, I was in one in high school, which I didn't really know. Um, it was more of a, uh, mental and emotional abuse. Um, then, when I went into, I got pregnant at um, 16 and my kid's uh, father was very abusive. Um, and my last, not my last kid, my kid's father, he was very abusive too. So I was like three relationships back to back, back to back. That was very abusive. Um, the My two kids' fathers was physically abusive. And my first boyfriend was more emotional and mental abuse. It was because um, I had low self-esteem and he, they, they they fat off it. They pretty much knew that I had low self-esteem, so they kind of can manipulate me to do things, and they knew if they treat me a certain way that I was going to stay. So that pretty much backbone, like, they kind of figured out because of my family history. My dad also abused my mom, and they knew me going into it, going into the relationship, me telling them about myself and disclosing this information. They knew that what they can and what they can't get away with me. So they took advantage of that. That's, that's how I personally feel. Uh, I definitely, uh, again, you know, I know, you know, it may be, I know you said that telling these stories and, you know, speaking on these um, traumas you've gone through in life, um, the more you do it, the easier it is to, mm -hmm. you know, do so. Um, I want to ask you a question. Like when you, the first time you had to you know, sit down with someone or family, friends, whoever it was, and, you know, tell them what you had gone through, um, I'm, I'm I'm assuming that was the hardest time, but what made you have like that confidence or that that uh, I guess that 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 willingness to at that moment, you know, take that step um, and do that? The crazy thing about it, um, I don't talk to my family about it. Um, my family is more of a sweep it up under type of the rug type of situation. It, we don't talk about it. It doesn't exist. So my family has witnessed situations and in the moment it exists but after the next day we don't talk about it so it was more of me trying to walk it into myself and me wanting to be a better mother that made me start talking about it so it's not to my family it was more to the world the world heard my story before my family heard it and I don't even think my family don't listen to my podcast or listen to like come to my events and stuff like that probably because they don't really want to acknowledge their wrongs or them they're not standing by my side or just being there for me so I haven't actually hit that hurdle with my family that much 
Uh, oh, I, and I definitely hope that that, you know, is something that you're able to do song. But when who are, the first person you told, whether it was a, fr a friend, you know, I guess, it wasn't family, but a friend, uh, you know, a therapist, coach, whoever it was, like what, like what made you finally have that confidence to do so? Because I know a lot of people struggle, even now, who will be listening to this um, interview. Like there's people out there who have struggled with the same things you have gone through, whether it's mental, uh, emotional, um, physical abuse, and they don't know how or they don't feel confident enough or you know, they're scared to just come out and tell somebody um, things they've gone through. What, like, what made you feel, I guess, the confidence to do that? Oh, my kids. It was my kids. Um, I feel like my kids was being affected by the lack of knowledge of the story. So every it's like your truth, their truth, and then it's the real truth. And the way they was telling their truth, it made it seem like I was the bad guy. And it made it seem like they had a horrible mother and I was just this horrible person because I never told my side of the story. So I wanted to have a, I wanted to have a voice at that point. Like the kid, my kids deserve to know that their mom didn't, wasn't that person. So I decided to speak up. So that's what gave me the courage to speak up about what's going on and how, um, what really happened and how it went down because my kids was, mentally getting affected emotionally getting affected now they be started to get abused because my lack of me speaking up and talk about what's going on i want to ask you a question um in reference to, i know you said that you know two of the three um you know men that you had deal with though dealt with that you know were abusive in some way shape form fashion in your life um they you know they were a physical um i want to ask you in general do you believe since you are a person who has gone through these traumatic experiences do you believe that a person can actually change um, and not be that way later in life? Or do you feel like, you know, once they are that way, that's just kind of how they are and that's just what they are. Do you, you think that people can evolve and change after being that way? Yes. Now, and the reason why I ask you I that is be, the reason why I ask you is because specifically um, the two uh, the two later ones who did it, the two, the second and third, they're actually the fathers of your children. And so um, mm -hmm. I know that, you know, we all hope to at least be able to co-parent at the very least um, with the you know the other half of the person who created our child, and so I ask you, like, do you think that it's a it's a change that can be made? Yes, uh, I still co-parent um, with my last father, not the not the other one. Um, <laughs> but um, they can change. Um, like I tell people this all the time. When it comes to my kid's father and our situation that was abusive, it it could be your environment that can cause you to do things that you wouldn't usually do so it all depends on the environment that he's in like he was in like because of our situation I feel like he had to grow up faster than he was ready for so the pressure of that he didn't know how to deal with the pressure what was the responsibility that was put on him so he didn't know how to cope and his way of coping was trying to control me and trying to make me do what he needed me to do so that he could feel better in his situation but as he grew and started to find security in himself and started to work on himself, he acknowledged where he went wrong at. And he apologized to me several times. He's like, I will never, ever, if I could go back and fix it, I would. You know what I'm saying? So he has grown and developed into a better person because he did the work. Now, if you're not going to do the work and acknowledge where you went wrong on, then know that person probably won't change. It all depends on the person and the environment and the work that they're willing to put in if they can change or not. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. So what, and you know, again, and I don't want to say in your experience, like it's a good yeah. thing, but more so just the experiences you've gone through um, with these different types of abuse. Um, what are some red flags that you would, you know, say or give to, I guess, signs to, you know, that you, if you're giving this advice to a group of women, what would you tell them? Hey, these are some signs you should look out for. Um, I know like a lot of times now in 2023, we hear um, certain words all the time. And I think most people, I'll say a lot of people don't necessarily even know what the words mean. They're just saying them because they're quote unquote hot, like, you know, narcissistic Gassy. or gaslighting, mm -hmm. you know, things of that nature. I already saw you kind of nodding before I even said, cause you knew where I was going, but um, yeah. what are some, you know, like red flags or some signs that women um, should or could look for um, if they're dealing with somebody who potentially has the capability of being an abuser of some sort? That's the crazy, that's the crazy part about it is like, um, the big ones is like the controlling, like off the back, like somebody like this generation, 
what they have to worry about, I tell my daughter this all the time, is like somebody that tried to isolate you. Like the biggest thing, like, oh, I want you all to myself. Um, you should spend time with me, 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 me. A person that's all about me and just don't want to get to know your family or don't want to be around your family or just try to spend time with you by yourself all the time and then just try to like oh or try to tell you something about your friends like the these younger generations um they they always on attack like oh your friend this friend this friend doesn't like you this friend doesn't buy you like me like they're trying to manipulate them and stuff like that so just understanding that you need other people outside of your relationship so if that person just want you to themselves that's a big red flag to me because we cannot just be in a relationship with our significant others. Like you have to have family. You have to, you can't just be consumed because then you become codependent. I mean, you won't have an independent, you won't have your own thought process. And when you're only, and when you're only relying on that person to feed you love, compassion and everything, and you, you depend on them. And then you come so obsessed with that person that no matter what happens, you will stay. And that kind of what happened with me. Like, I, they isolated me. I isolated myself where that person was my only source of everything. And I couldn't, I wasn't getting it from nobody else. And because of that, I came codependent. I came relying on that type of love and relying on that person to provide me with things. So you just have to be very cautious with somebody that's very controlling or really trying to just keep you to themselves. Any person that's in a healthy relationship, they want you to have other relationships. They want you to coexist with other people. They want their own personal space, too. Like, everybody, yes, I want to be with you, but I want to do my own thing, too. They don't want to have know every aspect of your life, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing who you're doing, why you're doing it with that person. So you got to be very cautious of that. And another one is, like... These kids, my daughter do it. Like, I make her hang on the phone. They stay on the phone all night. Like, oh, I'm sleeping, on, I'm sleeping on the phone. Why are you on the phone? Why are you sleeping on the phone with this person? That makes no sense to me. Hang up the phone. They're they're relying on this person. Now they're coming codependent. Like, you have to be two independent, and two independent people coming together in a relationship for me. And there, a lot of people are developing codependent tendencies. I wanted to ask you um, specifically about something you just said right now. I know a lot of people, even grown people for sure, um, they think it's like cute and like yeah. um, cuddly and like, you know, mushy, mushy to like, you know, FaceTime with their significant other at night and fall asleep together on FaceTime or uh, be on the phone and talk to them late night and fall asleep on the phone or like, hey, you sleep? No, I'm up. You know, we all did it when we were younger. Um, you know, grown people who still have that mindset, like, do you think in your opinion that it, like, do you agree that it's, still wrong like they should not want to do that it's weird or do you feel like it's just like a, a are you saying like it's a separation of the behaviors of one of the parties on the phone that makes it where it becomes weird you know what i'm saying is it oh is it i mean what i'm saying is it a generalization or is it just it, it's, 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 it's a it, it doesn't matter if they're young or older i think it's just a codependent thing now you're relying on that person for something like you have to figure out why do you want to be on the phone are you want do you want to be on the phone with that person all night because you don't trust them or do you want to be close to them it's the reason why you want to be on the phone the whole time. Why do you have a GPS location on this person? Like, why are you tracking every person location? Are you tracking them because you want to make sure they're safe? Or are you tracking them because you want to know where they are? I see. See, all, it's all because it all depends on the purpose of why you're doing it. And I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's healthy anyways. Like, knowing where that person is at all times. And then when you don't, it creates anxiety inside of you. Like you, you're panicking and now all you can think about is what that person doing, where they're at. And now you can't function in your life outside of that person. Because at one point, if you start the relationship where you know where this person is 24 seven, and now you're trying to, now that the relationship has hit a certain point where you can't be around that person 24 seven, because as adults, we have to go to work. We have to take care of doctor's appointment. We got to do stuff like that. So you cannot locate that person 24-7. You cannot interact with that person 24-7. And then if you're if that is interfering with the way you function in life, it's a problem. Now you're, co you're creating codependent tendencies where you shouldn't, and it can cause bigger problems down the line because now this person can get anxiety, and anxiety can cause people to do a lot of crazy stuff like because you don't know what's going on. Now you're now you're getting on defense and like, what were you doing now? Your mind, especially people that had trauma like me, 
you thinking like, okay, or people that come from relationships that been cheated on. Now that you don't, this person don't answer the phone, you call them twice and then I answer the phone. Now you're thinking they're cheating. Now, you now your mind is wandering because you, before you was able to have access to this person and now you don't have that access. Now you're going crazy. Like you're being on the phone all night. And one night that person might actually want to sleep and they don't want to be on phone, be on the phone with you that night because they actually want to sleep. And you are thinking now they're cheating on me. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're doing that because this is something you came dependent on. It shouldn't. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. I feel you. I wanted to ask you a few questions um, in reference to your children, because um, you have been blessed with two children, you said, right? Four. Four children. Okay. Um, so since your since your children um have probably witnessed some of the things you've gone through, um, like, and I'm, I'm sure they didn't like those things, you know, so particularly, you know what I'm saying, like boys or girls, really, but just as children in general, seeing stuff like that with their parent, their mom in particular, they usually don't like it. I've gone through it myself um, growing up. But like, um, like, what are you doing to like make sure that their mental is on point? You know, a, a lot of times now, especially in 2023, again, mental health is a big thing that people advocate for. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of, you know, foundations. People talk about it all the time. Celebrities are coming out left and right, speaking on different, you know, disabilities they may have or mental issues they may have. Um, as a parent, you know, as, as that nurturer by default, um, what are you doing for their mental to make sure that they are good? Um, well, one of my kids is in therapy, but that's more because he has like ADHD and, um, my other kids, we just do weekly check-ins. Like we have conversations, we do family meetings. We, we talk about what's going on in their relationships. Um, my, my oldest daughter, she's 18 and she still comes to me. Like, that's another thing that we go into like her, like me and her has a close relationship and her boyfriend doesn't like that she comes to me for advice, like, oh, your mom shouldn't be in her business. Like, she's like, I don't, like, my mom been through stuff like this, so I'm going to come to her, and I'm going to talk to her about it, and I'm going to take, I'm going to talk to her, and I'm going to take her, um, her recommendations if I feel like it fit. Like, she doesn't have to listen. She, she knows that everything I say is not gold. You know what I'm saying? But she, she wants to listen to me. She value my, she value what I say, so she feel like, I'm going to come to my mom. She's been through a lot. And I feel like this is something that she's been through. So I'm going to talk to her about it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just having a real open relationship with them and a non-judgmental relationship. Like not letting your kids feel like what they're coming to you is judging them. Like, oh, uh, you shouldn't be doing that. I don't care. Like, don't say that. Like, if you want your kids to come to you and be open about what they're experiencing, like have a safe space for them. Like, mom dad I need a judge free moment like I need to come to you and this is very serious I don't want to feel judged I don't want to get in trouble for it I just want to openly have this conversation so I have a space for them to do that with me where they don't have to feel like they're being judged or gonna get in trouble or anything or criticized about what they're about to tell me so just having a free open space and safe place and just having open discussions every week um talk about different type of topics every week. My one daughter's in high school, my other one in college. So they're going through some stuff. And my middle child, she is, um, uh, she's gay. So she a lesbian and she's going through a whole other situation and just helping her balance her relationships and balance what she's going through with her coming out in high school it's a lot so her mental is like up and down so just having open conversations and just knowing that let her know that i love her and i accept her and that she should be around people that love and accept her is like my biggest thing just bracing them embracing them loving them and just accepting them for who they are and what they're going through and understanding them that's that's how i pretty much approach their mental state I feel that. And I, I think that's very admirable um, for sure. Um, you go dealing with different, you know, avenues of life that, you know, many people may not even have the opportunity to experience. Um, of your four children, you, I know you said two are girls. How, are the other two boys? Or is it three girls? Three, girls one, three boy. girls, one boy. Um, okay. So I want to ask you with the son, do you like, do you feel you have to, or do you at all parent him differently? Um, you know what I'm saying? Like due to the experiences you've gone through? No, actually, I paired them all equally. I let them all know, like, no hands. Like, we don't put hands on nobody. We talk with our words. And if hands is put on you only in defense, we will put hands back. Like, we don't we do not do that. Um, 
Yeah, I was about um, to ask when you, it like, comes that... to like his manners and stuff like that, I kind of do a little different, like opening doors, closing doors, taking out trash and stuff like that. A little different, yes. When it comes to that, but when it comes to like relationships, no. When it comes just... talking about relationships, I equally talk to him on the same like playing field because his rights and our women rights are the same to me like he deserve respect and love and appreciation just like my girls do yeah i was gonna ask you um in reference to like you know due to due to the the physical abuse you've gone through um with your children like you know most you know in our culture especially in black culture most um parents will definitely teach their children to defend themselves mm -hmm. and i was gonna ask you like do you look at just physicality or physical um you know altercations totally different so what i mean i know you tell your children to defend themselves but like does it ever make you pause like do you you know does it does it would it create a trigger if you got a call and they say hey when your children got you know in a fight like you know what i'm saying do you feel like there's basically what i'm trying to say is do you feel like there's other ways alternate ways to um you know rectify situations other than the physical um, you know, action of like fighting. You know what I'm saying? Like, does it make? Oh yeah, I always that? tell them. Yeah, only only time I tell my kids that um to hit back is if they feel like they have no other way to defend themselves. Like, you're not. I'm not gonna allow them to sit there and to let somebody just beat the hell out of them. Like, no. If you feel like your life is in danger or it's a way that you can't get away, get out of the situation, I'm gonna need you to defend yourself. Like, but I always tell them, especially in school, I'm like. If it's possible, go tell a teacher. If it's possible, tell somebody that you trust. That you trust. Try to walk away. And if you feel like this person is going to keep attacking at you, don't, just don't interact with this person at all. Like I try to tell them to avoid the person or try to avoid the situation as best way possible. But if it comes to a point where they have to defend it, so do what you have to do. I feel that for sure. What do you think has become the greatest asset about yourself now that you've gone through these different experiences, like, you know, and, and I asked because, say it again? Empathy. Empathy, okay. Mm -hmm. Because I I get to see, now that I've been through so much, when when I see people going through things, I get it. Like, I don't automatically, not people like, oh, that person, that person angry. I'm like, yeah, they angry, but why? Like, always my mind go, why? It doesn't go like, oh, that person angry, just get away from me. I'm like, why are you angry? I always think of the why behind the action. Like, what caused that person to be angry? Like, what is happening inside that person? Like, why are they lashing out like that? What happened? Who hurt that person? Why is that person so hurt? So I get the feel. I, I try to understand and try to relate and understand people more since I've been through what I've been through. Because I want that for me. Like, why is she so angry? Why is she feeling that way? Why is she lashing out like that? Why is she not knowing that it could be a trigger? Like, we don't know what people have been through. And that person could be angry or yelling or sad or doing whatever they're doing because they're triggered. And they might not even know that they're triggered. But we just automatically judge a lot. And I don't think that we should judge. We should just try to understand. Even if we don't agree, we can understand. We can agree to disagree. You don't have to judge or make that person feel bad or try to hurt that person even more because of how they decide to express themselves. Not saying that because a person angry, they get to treat you a certain way. I think that you get to try to understand people. And if they don't want to express it, you have a right to walk away. You don't have to try to make that person feel worse or make the situation worse by having a negative reaction to it. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know what I'm saying? Um, you said empathy is one of your strongest um, attributes now. What are one of the ones that you're, you know, um, continuously trying to work on um, to better? Like maybe one that has been affected by these experiences. What's one that you're, you know, um, steadily trying to better um, each day? People pleasing. <laughs> um, it's still kind of hard for me to say no. It's still kind of hard for me to kind of put me first. So I'm still working on that. Um, I know for me to be the best version of me, I have to take care of me. So just getting in touch with what I need and putting me first is something that I'm still working on. And my, my last question I wanted to ask you, Rose, um, a lot of times when people go through experiences, um, Can you hear me? Hello? 